So, Nehemiah chapter 5, so we're fairly deep into it. So, we've seen that this man, Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to a pagan king, he was just a faithful public servant, basically. He came from Persia and traveled with a bunch of people and returned to Jerusalem. And his purpose was a construction project. And even construction projects can be holy. For example, we are currently in the process of putting air conditioning in our gymnasium. Yes! <laughs> and we all know that that's holy. <laughs> so we've been years. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be perfectly on time. It's going to be ready when the first cold front comes in, and we don't need it. But anyways, we're, you know, next summer it should be all fresh and ready to go. But anyways, one, God uses projects to minister to people. Uh, God uses projects to put us in a place where we can learn, where we can receive from him. And God uses projects to challenge us in our faith and help us to grow. I tell you what, I think I've grown a, quite a bit over the last two years when three of us were trying to remodel my bathroom. <laughs> Just finished the other day. And uh, yeah, so... God uses these things. And I always tell the staff and the leadership uh, in our church that, you know, the, the, the reason we have projects, really the, the end goal isn't the project. All that ultimately is temporary. The, the end goal is the character that it develops in us and those around us. And all the staff is, is told to, yeah, the, the project is never more important than the person. But the Lord laid this on Nehemiah's heart. And as Nehemiah goes back and he thinks it's just construction, what's going to be happening is all kinds of other uh, unique things will be happening um, as we see the people come together, work hard, um, watch each other's back, protect one another, and, and, and pour in sacrificially uh, to the project. And so today we don't see an outward pressure coming in on the people or on Nehemiah. Today we see an inward pressure taking place and correction actually takes place um, within the people. And so we're going to learn a lot of lessons from this. So Nehemiah chapter 5. Um, so he comes into the land. At this point, he started rebuilding the walls and the gates. He, before this, he had inspected the walls. He had developed a vision. And then he brought it to the leaderships. He got some, the, the leadership, he got buy-in from people. And then he got the people to work together and watch each other's back. And then people came against him from the outside. They didn't want him to be protected. And we talked about this personally. This often happens to us when we start to walk strong with the Lord. People from the outside don't like that. They don't want that. And uh, they will go, oh, you were so much more fun before. Yes, as a self-destructed alcoholic, I was probably more fun to you, <laughs> right? You know, I was a clown you could watch or whatever it might be. And, and so people will do this, and Satan has a way of doing that. But here we're going to see some internal things happening and some internal correction. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1 reads, And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. So again, there's never any rest. They're trying to fulfill a plan of God, the will of God, and they're not going to rest. <laughs> It, it, it comes against us. Whenever we're running hard towards God, there is resistance. And I found out when I used to uh, race bicycles that the harder you pedal, the more wind is in your face, right? And that's kind of how it goes. And uh, if you're not being pressured from the outside, there'll be pressure from the inside when you're doing God's work. So they're brethren against brethren. These complaints are arising. Verse 2. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren and our children as their children, and indeed, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have lands and vineyards. 
And so the list of issues is long, and it's serious. They're, they're having all kinds of problems, and it all has to do with financing. And when it says our daughters have become slaves, basically they sell themselves to be servants to others in order to pay off debt. It wasn't true slavery in the sense that we see slavery. It was indentured servanthood to pay off debts, right? So what were the complaints? One, we cannot get enough grain. The Persian king had confiscated the land and was not necessarily allowing the Jews to grow enough to eat during this time. And the people were working on the wall very hard. They needed to eat more, and they weren't able to produce enough. We have mortgaged our possessions to buy grain. We're hungry. We're eating more than ever. We're working harder than ever, and we're not producing any grain. We're not working the land that we do have. We have borrowed money to pay taxes, taxes that never came back into the land in which they were collected. The taxes would go where? To Persia. And now we've been taken into slavery by our brethren, so we're borrowing from those we know, but now we're selling our children and ourselves into future indentured servanthood. And we don't have anything left to purchase them out of this. And so then they would have to wait six years. And on the seventh year, they would, they would receive them back. That's that every seven years, slaves would be able to go back uh, home, right? Unless it was a year of jubilee, and then everything would be returned. And so these are all basically financial problems. And we need to understand that our money is just a part of our life and our spirituality as anything else. And we tend to separate that out. And finances are important. And so the reality is we think that we can cheat people over here and then go worship God with a clear heart over here. And it, and it doesn't work that way. We are integrated together. When you buy a house, you need to pray about that house that you buy. When you get a mortgage, you pray about that mortgage. When you buy a car, you pray about that car. And, and, and you're patient and you wait for God to direct you. You don't just jump in because it's a good idea at the moment. And if we don't handle money with the right heart and make final, uh, financial decisions with an eye towards eternity, we can make mistakes that will affect the work of God in our lives for years and years. And so maybe we supported missions and God always honored that. And we thought, man, if we only cut out our missionaries and we can buy this little bit bigger house. See how that works? Or we can buy a new car instead of a used car. And then you give up on the spirituality that you were developing and the blessings you were developing by being a generous giver to the things of the Lord. And so it's essential to handle your money with the right heart before God. And God gave his only begotten son. God gave. God provided. Throughout the Bible, he's always provided. And he's given. But he gave his most precious for our need. God is gracious and God is generous. And if we want to follow God, we need to be willing to be generous ourselves. And why? Why? Because it sets our priorities. And I, and I say this often, and I, I obviously a lot to our school of ministry, and school of ministry just means school of service. If you dedicate your life to ministering and serving others, you're going to prioritize your time in a different way than if you dedicate your life only to your own pleasures. And so all of a sudden, your priorities are spiritually led because you're dedicating time to God. It's also true of your finances. If you dedicate your finances first to the Lord and your first fruits to the Lord, and you're willing to be there, what do you do? You prioritize your finances more according to God. It sets our priority. And so the New Testament tells us that our giving should be regular, thoughtful, proportional, and not showy or private. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4 talks about being generous and cheerful about our ability to give. For me, as a single young man, I would give, but it'd be very sporadic. And then I met Noreen, and before we got married, we had had our first child overseas that we adopted in, in, uh, through a Christian organization. And we've never, got, we, we've never been without that since before we were married. 
And so my wife helped me get more organized, and God has always honored that. And there have been times when literally the most basic bills in our life added up to, at times, $450 more than we had on a monthly basis, more than my paycheck. And uh, it, was, it was a miracle. But we were in that, that zone of, of living below what we were making for about four and a half years as we were planting this church out here. But one of the things we were determined to do at that time was, I think we had maybe three different mission organizations that we were giving to and we were giving to the church that we decided we're going to give first still. And you know what? There was times when I'm going, okay, God, the surf's not very good here in Corpus Christi. It's really hot. The weather's better in California. <laughs> you know, if you don't provide, we're not going to drag your, your name through the mud. And you know what? God provided every month and we were still able to take care of our missionaries. And then over the years, as our finances got better, we were able to support more and more and more. And it's a blessing to do so. I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm like any guy. I can be stingy and, oh my gosh, except for when it's my hobbies, right? That's us as men, <laughs> you know? But I can be stingy at times, and, and, but the reality is I love giving to missions. And, and, and it's rare uh, you know, that, that it's even, even an issue. My wife is still the more generous one. But we as a team um, have been blessed to increase as our income has increased. And what a blessing it is to give in that way. And God has organized. I am not necessarily good with money. In, in the sense, though, that I'm good with money in the sense that I don't um, overspend. We, we try to live within our means. And we've been stressed out at times, but God has always showed up. And, and it's not only myself and my testimony. It's the testimony that we've seen in this church for the last almost 26 years now. That, that, that people that give and prioritize their money to the Lord are not chronically in financial trouble. Now, every so often, for me, I, I blew a piston in a car and I had to, you know, figure out how to get that money. I've, I've had windshields broken in my cars and different things have popped up when we didn't have enough to pay for it, you know? And so periodically, yeah, things come up, but God has always ultimately been faithful on a regular basis. And we found that to be true in our counseling over the years, that those that are faithful and put God as our priority have prioritized their finances in such a way that God has provided and so, um, when we give our first fruits to the Lord, it does set our priorities. Now, again, money problems are rarely our only problems. Because an attitude towards God in that way normally is reflected in other ways as well. And those that are undisciplined with money are just going to be undisciplined with money. Again, God helps us be disciplined with money. You know, if you look at the lives of many, the majority of those that win a large lottery pot or come to unexpected riches, the fact is, those who make millions in the lottery are often broke within five years. That's a fact. Isn't that bizarre? We're like, just, just give it to me. <laughs> yeah, I just watch it go. And there is a huge problem within professional sports. I don't know how much a lineman makes in the NFL today, but they have a minimum salary. And last I heard, it was about $350,000. But that was years ago, a year. That's minimum for, for, for a big guy that, you know, blocks, Okay. $350,000. And we know that stars make way more than that. But literally within five years after retirement, many, the majority, are broke. So much so that there have been those that have really tried, and many of them are Christians, to say, you know what? You need to manage your money. You know, go out, don't go out and buy the bling. Don't just go support every little, you know, you, you, you need to set some aside for your future. Right? And, and so... This happens. Why? Because they're not prioritizing their money 
You know, so some people are disciplined, but as Christians, the greatest way to do that is to prioritize your money before God, right? And so their issues here are going back to money problems, how to handle their money, how to glorify God with your money. And, and the same problems will soon show up again and again, often bigger than ever, if you don't get that right in your life. So he hears of these issues, and it says in verse 6, and this is Nehemiah speaking, and I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. He's upset. Why? For, for a large part of it, it's an internal problem, and we'll see how he fixes it. But we see that Nehemiah is angry. And we're going to see that his anger is not an unjust anger, and we'll look at reasons for that. Now, the Bible says, be angry and do not sin. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, anger should be at an injustice and an abuse, one that dishonors God and takes advantage of the weak. It's not a selfish anger, right? It's, 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 it's an anger, it's, it's a frustration towards those that are dishonoring God and enslaving the weak. Remember, Jesus was angry with the people who were taking advantage of the worshipers in the temple because he walked in there. What did he find? They were selling animals to sacrifice at exorbitant costs for those that have traveled weeks to come and worship God. And what are you going to do now? You just, you're not going to buy my $20,000 sheep over here to sacrifice? And what they had was they had inspectors inspecting the sheep, and they're saying, oh, no, this one isn't good enough. We'll buy it for you for, for, from you for 20 bucks, and then they take it back, and then they turn around and sell that same sheep for 200 bucks. So that's how that was working. Okay, and so he saw this. What were they doing? Well, you had to pay taxes with a specific temple coin. And as you did this, you know, you would bring $100 worth of your local money, and then you would buy $20 worth of temple money. And so it was, it was, they, they, they were charging exorbitant amounts and taking advantage of people. And what did he do? It says, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with sheep and oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And so the outer courtyard was meant to be a place where visitors would come and see the glory of God. And they would be drawn into the worship of God. And what was it? And I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Middle Eastern bazaar, but they're crazy. They're very interesting, and <laughs> they're pretty wild. Uh, when we went into the Grand Bazaar there in Istanbul one time with Noreen, they see this middle-aged white lady, money, 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 and they're just attacking her the whole time. And I'm sitting there kind of trying to push them away, and it was just, it was just ah, sell, 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 you know? But this is what was happening in the Temple Mount where, where uh, Gentiles were supposed to come and fall in love with God. And, and, and it wasn't a house of worship. It wasn't a place of glorifying God. It was a place of greed. It was a place of manipulation. It was a scene. And so Jesus gets upset and he pushes them out. But that was Jesus. He knows how to have holy anger. For me, it normally gets me into trouble. So I need to be very careful with my anger. Most of the time, it's said that anger is temporary insanity. Would you agree? And it has to be something that we seek to manage in our lives. It's not justified. Oh, I'm Italian. So what? You're in sin. You know, I'm a passionate Latino. <laughs> You're still in sin, right? Some of my lineage comes from Vikings. I get mad, I bring out an axe and chop off your head. You know, whatever, you know, it's like, come on. It's all sin, and we're human beings. And the Bible applies to all of us. Can you be angry and not sin? And so we need to be careful, because some people see Jesus, you know, driving out the animals. I don't see him whacking people with the, with, with the whip. People kind of see that image in their head. 
I think you can get that out of your head. He drove them out. And he might have hit a few sheep and animals to get them moving out. Turned over tables, but I don't think he bruised anybody or bloodied them. Doesn't say that he did, right? Just said he drove them out. Why? Because people weren't allowed to worship. The ones that he wanted to be saved were being turned away by others' actions. So we got to be careful. We need to manage our anger and not look at Jesus and justify it, right? Watch out for anger. You can make bad decisions. Heard a story about some moose hunters up in Alaska. They go up to a remote lake where they have to fly in on an airplane. Well, they had a good catch that year. But the pilot says, this little plane won't lift all of us, the equipment, and both of your animals. You'll have to leave one behind. We'll never make it over those trees at the end of the runway if we try to carry both of these, uh, these animals. And one of the hunters said, that's baloney. And the other one agrees, you're just chicken. So they're saying this to the pilot. We came out here last year, and we got two moose. And that pilot had some guts. He wasn't afraid to take off. Yeah, said the first hunter, and his plane wasn't any bigger than yours. So now the pilot gets angry. Anger and pride, bad combination. And he said, if he did it, then I can do it. I can fly as well as anybody. They loaded up. They taxied at full throttle, and the plane almost made it. But it didn't have the lift to clear the trees at the end of the lake. It clipped the tops, it flipped, it broke up, scattering the baggage, the animal carcasses, and the passengers throughout all the brush. Still alive, but hurt in days, the pilot sits up and shook his head and says, where are we? And then one of the hunters rolled out from being thrown into a bush. He looked around and said, I'd say we're about 100 yards further than we made it last year. Okay. Some of you were listening, some weren't. Anyways, he was angry and prideful and it got him in trouble. So, so Paul wrote, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. It's possible to be angry for the right reasons. That's what this tells us. But too often, very often, and most often, it's sinful in my life. And really, when it says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, it's saying, deal with it and deal with it quickly. Get in your right mind. Why? Because the devil will get a foothold in your life, and you will make stupid choices, and you're going to wreck your plane. Now, anger is wrong when I am the cause of the anger, when I'm the source of the anger, when it's gotten in me, when it's not a righteous anger that's going to lead me to action on someone else's behalf or on God's behalf. Right? And so we need to catch ourselves. From Oswald Sanders' book, Spiritual Leadership, he says, anger becomes a sin when to favor a resentment or a feud, we imagine an injury done to us. And so what he's saying is it starts to play in your head, Right? And when someone wrongs you, what do you do? You keep on rerunning it, don't you? <clears throat> An injury done to us becomes, in our minds, greater than it really was. Once you start playing it over, it becomes a bigger deal, doesn't it? When you're playing it over in your head again and again, and you think about the last time you're angry. Isn't that what happens a lot of the time, if not most of the time? Without any real injury, it's normally something we can deal with. But it was, a, it was a word or a saying or something misunderstood or, you know, someone spoke out of line or maybe it was even deserved. We feel resentment on account of our pain or inconvenience. Our indignation rises too high. We get flustered and frustrated. We're out of control. We gratify resentments by causing pain or harm out of revenge. We want to lash out. And we are so perplexed and angry at sin in our own lives that we readily project anger at the sin we find in others. Sometimes it's like, I was so stupid. Let me, let me give you a silly example. So Thursday nights, I teach school of ministry. Our trash is picked up on Thursday 
Thursday, right? And very often, I uh, am late getting my trash can out <laughs> because Thursday comes after Wednesday night. And Wednesday, Thursday morning, I'm not in the best sorts because I've been teaching and I've been at church late and I've been studying from early in the morning, right? It's a long day for me on Wednesdays. And uh, so anyway, so lately we've only been able to water our lawns on Thursdays. And so Thursday night, I'm watering our lawn and I'll relax by watching stupid YouTube videos. Like, really dumb. You know, my wife's like, oh, brother, can't we watch something meaningful instead of disc golf? And, like, I'll watch mini golf sometimes just to get my brain off of anything. I can't, if you can take, if you can take mini golf seriously, you got a problem. It's not serious, but it puts my brain to sleep. And, and normally within about half an hour or so, I'm just like, I'm ready to go. So we had turned our, wa our water on, and then it was just like, you know, I forgot to turn my water off. Next morning, I wake up, and we have this little ticket on our door. <laughs> so our neighbor across the street, he, he, he often, you know, he's like, his lawn is always absolutely in place. He doesn't want us to park in front of his house. You know, everything's all perfect. But, and, uh, you know, he's kind of a watcher over the neighborhood. You know, it's like... Why don't you mow your lawn, huh? You know, one of, the, one of these neighbors, right? He's, I'm fine with them. I've never had any conflict with them really at all, you know. But I, I'm the neighbor that like, we're so busy. It's like our lawn isn't always mowed. You know, sometimes I have to move my trash cans to the other side of the street because I was too late. I hear them and I run out and they're already gone. And then, oh, the other side hasn't been done. And I put my trash can on the other side, right? <laughs> Dave LaFelt runs a trash pickup in Corpus and that's what he told me to do, right? So it's not sin. <laughs> No one owns the street. We all own the street, right? So anyway, so I'm, I'm a bit of a mess, right? And, and we have a lot of people that come to our house, and we park all over the place, and sometimes we have events, and sometimes people park them, you know? So I'm thinking, oh, he called them. And I was so upset. I was doing, like, like when, when, I, when I was looking at this today, as I was putting it in my notes, I'm going, oh, my gosh, nailed me. You know, it's like Oswald Sanders was in my head, right? I was just, you know, and I'm, I'm coming. I, I can't remember where I was going the next morning, but I was so upset. I guess it was Friday morning. And, and so, but, but literally, we did waste water, right? Because we mowed we, for hours. <laughs> we, we had our sprinklers on because I forgot. I just left them on and went to sleep. And so... You know, we blew it, we got the ticket. I'm thinking our neighbor called on me. But then later on, I looked at the ticket. It was given to me at 4.30 in the morning, probably by a cop that was on patrol. <laughs> My wife said we had flooded the street all the way down the street. All the whole gutters were full. So, and then I started thinking, oh, I was so mad. I am inconvenienced, right? I got to go to... I got to go down to the courthouse and figure out how to get this thing taken care of. Right? And so it's like a... But that's, that's over something silly. We did blow it. And, and, and we didn't turn off the water. And so I'm going to have to pay some fee. Right? I want to go on probation. <laughs> you know, not water my lawn anymore. <laughs> but anyways, just a, you know, silly thing. But we can do that in so many situations. And it has been interesting because over the years, I have learned to apologize to people. Because I, I blow it in that area. And sometimes it doesn't come out outward, right? Because I'm... I, I'm a pretty mellow person outwardly, but I can tell somebody, I am sorry because I, I, I was frustrated with you and it was wrong. I'm sorry. And they're like, what? What? You were frustrated with me? I go, me and God are good. I want to just be good with you, you know? And, and, and I'm free once I do that. But I don't want to do that because it's so much harder to always be repairing everything that you damage. 
rather than just not damage it in the first place, right? And our anger is, is just so out of control. And so we need to be careful with our anger. So Nehemiah himself is angry, but it does not cause him to do something selfish or stupid, but it causes him to act on behalf of others. So we're going to see what that is. Nehemiah 5, 7, it says, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each one of you is exacting usury. Not a word used very often anymore, but it means high interest. From his brother. They're being loan sharks, basically. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced, but found nothing to say. Because they're thinking, hey, great business opportunity. So he took time to respond. He rebuked the rich rulers who were in sin. They were taking advantage of the hard times of their brethren. It was not a rash rebuke. He responded in truth. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his anger. Have any of you ever been foolish? Yes, right? I mean, oh, ouch. But a wise man keeps himself under control. And that's the first step is, is, is controlling your outward anger and dealing with it before the sun goes down. And then when you learn that, the next step is to just, it's quicker and quicker and quicker to the point where you're not getting angry in the first place. But it is a process. So don't be a fool. Anger did not rule Nehemiah, but it set him to act. And he has serious thought about the situation. He calls an assembly and he says, let's deal with that. So he rebukes them according to logic, but also spiritual principles. Deuteronomy and Leviticus both speak of not taking advantage of your brother in that way. And he did not rebuke them because he felt it was the right thing, he, thing to do. It wasn't just his opinion that it was wrong. It was really wrong. And many times we'll rebuke people because of an opinion, not because of a principle, a true biblical principle, or a right and wrong principle. And so many times people say, well, I feel, 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 feel. And I go, well, what did I really do? I mean, I'm sorry that you're upset, but I don't know what I did that was biblically wrong. So we need to be careful about that. Because they transgressed the word of God, and he knew the word of God, so he doesn't turn a blind eye. He doesn't ignore the problem. He didn't take a poll and say, what is popular? Should I figure out what's popular for the people? He didn't think, what is a safe path forward? He says, what is right? Now, when you figure out what is right, you need to do it in the most effective way possible, which will be in the most clear and temperate way possible without your added anger. So much, so many times, our emotions and our anger add so much more unneeded information to the situation, doesn't it? And so, so often it's not always what you say, it's how you say it. And if you say it in love with humility, it's going to be received a lot better if you say it with superiority and pride and clear anger. But what is right? What is, what is the right thing to do in the situation? I think the next question right after that, what is now, now we know what's right, what is the right way to handle the situation? When I, when I talk to men, the first step when I talk to men and I'm correcting a man is I'm a man and I know how we as men respond when we're rebuked. And, and we live on this outward weird pride that God gave us. And when it's used for God, it's a good thing. When it's used for, for sinful reasons, it's horrible. But I, but I want to allow men to wrestle with it. 
And I know for me, a simple word to a man is going to come on him like a load of bricks. And so my first step is normally very controlled as much as I can. And, and then allow it to go from there. Because if you come in, guns a-blazing, I, I, it's not good. And I know that's true with most men, right? Or if I come towards a woman with, with, a, with a rebuke, and I don't rebuke women without their husbands there. Normally I don't rebuke women. It's normally up to women to rebuke women, right? And that's a biblical principle. But, you know, in that situation, if I'm trying to correct a daughter or my wife or, or someone in a... Way, I'm going I'm to correct them in a very gentle way and not in a threatening way. Because when women feel threatened, uh-uh. It's like when men's prides are hurt or, or women's security is, is at threat, nothing's getting through, right? And, and so we just need to do what is right, and the way we do it needs also to be right. And I do find it interesting, and we're going to see that he, he nails these guys, but listen... If I'm counseling you and it's just you and I, and, and I, I don't talk to you in person the way I preach from the pulpit. And it is different. You know why it's different? Because from the pulpit, it's spread out. And if I say something heavy and you apply it to your own life, and you might think he's speaking directly to me or whatever, you also know that I was speaking, you know, 50 other people than just you, Right? And so it's not as pertinent, but if it's across the table, you know, it's a little different. So he's speaking to this assembly of men. And so he's just coming straight at them. But if it was just, you know, hey, uh, you know, Shamil, get over here or whatever, you know, <laughs> whatever his name is. I need to talk to you about something. I need to, I need to bring some correction to your life. And so humble yourself. I, I want to challenge you with something. That's probably how he would have done it one-on-one, -on -one, but he drills them in a big group. And when he does that, they're also going to be challenged each other as well. They're going to agree that it's right, and now they're accountable to each other to get it done. And that's good as well, right? You see how that works, that accountability. Iron sharpens iron. So verse 9 says, then he said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury or this overcharging of interest. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and we will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Whew. Loaning without interest in troublesome times. Would God bless them and honor them for that? He sees it, doesn't he? Then I called the priests and I required an oath from them that they would do according to the promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus he may be shaken out and emptied. And the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. And I would pray, you know, for, for me, I do have this confidence that as, as a child in the family of God, even if something happened, I don't know that I would ever be without a roof over my head because I'm a part of the family of God. And I've seen the family react so well in so many instances. And I've told people this. You are part of the family of God. You've been there for years. You know, you're, you, you don't need to worry. You're always going to have a place to stay. And, 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 and someone in the body is going to be there for you. This is how it works. I remember in 2008, and I don't know if you guys remember, when... All the housing prices across the nation collapsed, if you're old enough to remember that. And here we are sitting at the church going, okay, we've been jamming as a church, <laughs> you know? And uh, everything was all good, and then all of a sudden, it's not. And 
we literally started thinking we need to be willing and ready to start assembling the body into groups where they can live in family groups together on one property. And so we had two or three families in our mind that could live on our property as well if things got really bad. And we had children in the home, and these other people had children, but we're thinking, okay, so there's men there, and, and if we have three families together, there'll always be a man there, at least ready, in a sense, to defend the people, and then we can combine the groups, and we can live much cheaper, and we can have three income. And we're thinking this way. How can we bless each other during those hard times? Right? And, and so this is what Nehemiah is doing. And so he doesn't turn a blind eye, he deals with it and he goes for it with the people who can make a difference. And for those who refuse, he says, may God shake you out, man. You know, you take a towel and you go, Shwump! that's what he's saying. May God just do that to you if you're not willing. You have the means. What are you holding on to? Be on God's team. So Nehemiah did this with himself as well. He told them, I am loaning to people as well. When you call people to sacrifice, you must be willing to sacrifice as well. Right? Do you realize that in our Congress, they pass laws all the time that they're not under? When they were messing with everybody's health insurance, they weren't under that same health insurance plan. Isn't that interesting? It's odd. Leadership often does not do what they're asking others to do. I remember this character, Al Gore. He was trying to get everybody to give more money to charities. And most of those charities happened to be charities that he was connected to. And then someone investigated or leaked his tax information and he gave 1.3% of the money that he was making to charitable organizations himself. Now, here's the deal. As a Christian, you ought to be red flagged on your taxes. I don't care how much money you make, but it, you know, it goes down and says, like in, in TurboTax or something, it says, you know, at the end when they, they assess whether your taxes look good, I, I, I hope every year I get a red tag. People in your income bracket... Do not give as much as you do. You all, as a believer, you always ought to get that, right? And whether it's missions or to the church or, you know, like organizations that are fighting for righteousness, well, praise God, that's, you, you ought to run into that, right? But so often people can be hypocritical. Nehemiah was asking these men to give up collecting interest. And he said, I will also do it. But that's not all. He goes even further You know, as, as a believer, I just realized over the years, I cannot afford to be stingy with the money that God has provided for me. And, and, and so I want to be faithful and generous in my giving. And again, I think I said it Sunday, but, you know, sometimes I think, man, with the amount of money that I give to the church and give to missions monthly... I could have one of those really big trucks. I have a truck. I love my truck. My truck is 13 years old, but I love my truck. But it's before they got really high and big, you know? And, uh, um, but quickly I realized this. I can't afford not to give because I know if I didn't give, I would have less. I, I really know this. What would happen with my priorities? My priorities would be different and that giving first. And I always say my wife is more generous than me. I don't know that I'll ever catch up with my wife and her generosity. But a couple of years ago, at the beginning of every year, I, I set a spiritual goal. And a couple of years ago, it was to be more generous. Oh, that was hard. We're out with a bunch of young people, you know, and... I had a mortgage and car payments and all this. And I'm like, okay, I'll get the check. Ouch. <laughs> you know, but thank you, Lord. You know, and uh, 
it was good. It was, it was a good year. Now I'm still stingy, but no, just kidding. <laughs> I've learned a little bit better, and I've grown, and that was, that was a good year. So I can't afford to be less generous with the money God provided for me. I want to learn how to be wise, but also more generous at the same time. And if I'm faithful with my money, and God wants me to give somewhere that it needs to be giving, I love being the source of that help. What a blessing. I can be in on God's plan in somebody's life. We did baptisms on Sunday, and everybody says, thank you for baptizing me. And I look at them, and I always say, are you kidding me? It's my honor. I get to be a part of your story with God. What a blessing. And the same goes with being able to be generous with who we are. So going on in verse 14, it says, Moreover, from that time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me had laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. So he had provision from Persia, and he also had the right to tax like his predecessors, and he said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use the provision from Persia to help the people, and I'm not going to tax people locally. And so what is he saying? He's saying, I'm asking you guys to sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice too in these hard times. That's what he's saying. He's being an example. Paul was a godly example as well. What did he say? He says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. I'm not asking you to do as I say, but not do as I do. I'm asking you to do as I say and do as I do. Watch. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. Now, you need to know, this wasn't always the case in Paul's case, sometimes he needed to be supported because the work was so radical. But other times when he knew the situation that people were in, and he realized, if I come and I'm supported by you, I know how you are. I know your heart. And so the Corinthians were rich. Their city was a rich city. It was a trade city. It was a port city. And so when he went to Corinth, he spent a lot of time there. And you know what he did? I'm going to be here for a while. Instead of having support here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go make tents. And he discipled people while he made tents. He was a tent maker. And that's where we get the idea of tent making, when people go out and plant churches or whatever, right? And so his tent making was literally tent making. That's where we get it from. Because the Corinthians were rich, but they were selfish, and it's so interesting. If you do many missions, you find that those that are poor are generous. <laughs> and those that are rich kind of have their house closed. And this, king, this castle is, is my kingdom. Don't come in here. And we're kind of like that, aren't we? But as Christians, we ought to be moving in the other direction. We ought to be hospitable and generous. Right? And uh, so this was him. He was being an example because his ministry was more effective because of it. And he was an example of generosity. Verse 16, he says, Indeed, I also count, uh, continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. I'm focusing to get the job done. He came to do the work, and that's what he was going to do. He didn't get distracted. Parable of the soils. He didn't let the weeds grow up around him and choke out his purpose. He was focused on what he was supposed to do. Let's build the wall. He remained a simple man on a construction project. 
He didn't let his notoriety, his fame, them putting him on a pedestal, distract him from the work. Verse 17, and at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. And fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in the spirit of this I did not demand the governor's provision, because the bondage was heavy on this people. And so not on tax money, but people were giving and people were watching this example and God provided. Where God guides, God provides. Don't use that loosely because sometimes we're trying to guide God and then expect him and force him to provide. <laughs> we're, we're, we, we use extortion on God. That's not what we're supposed to do. But in this case, what was he doing? He denied the tax money and God provided enough money for him to feed hundreds of people a day. What a blessing. It was, it was so interesting when, when God had called us to defend Hannah Overton, who many of you are going to hear on Friday. And uh, she was in prison. Uh, they didn't have the means to, to pay lawyers. Many of the lawyers had volunteered a lot of their time, but there was still a lot of money that had to happen or had to be raised. And, and so hundreds and thousands and uh, up into the millions of dollars were raised to pay a lot of these legal fees over a 10-year period of time. And so here we are as a church, and even then, you know, we're, we're under all this controversy, so it wasn't so comfortable here. So we went to about 600 people on Sundays to about 150 to 200 people on Sundays. But still, all this money was coming through the church. And it was amazing, because these people had given $300,000 to the defense fund of Hannah. And they were hedge fund managers in New York City living in a penthouse. And then they gave us $27,000 and they said, don't spend this on Hannah. We've been to your church. You need your parking lot finished. You guys, that whole right side of the parking lot that's cement out there that's not asphalt, that came out of the blue. Right? We weren't saying, oh, look at all this money coming in. It's all just money coming into the church. It wasn't necessarily earmarked. Oh, yeah. You know, pastor's getting a new house. You know, it wasn't. We were focused on what God had before us. And what happened? God provided what we needed. The week before we had found that out, an older woman had parked. We had a caliche out there, and she tripped on the caliche. And then the next week, this came in. God was looking at his sheep and going, okay. Right? I mean, now I don't presume, you know, on God. We were just trying to figure it out, be faithful. We were praying a lot of hours during that time as well. God provides in unique, special ways. We don't presume upon him, but it's amazing. Again, I sit on a lot of church boards of small churches and growing churches that are trying to find buildings, and I'm like, always be praying for the miracle. Always be looking for the miracle. God can provide. Verse 19, remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. That is not self-serving. He just recognizes God's gracious promise that he will care for the needs of those who walk with him. These are promises of God. And he helps every time, but not always economically or materially, right? Spiritual blessings are eternal, and sometimes they're just what's needed. Sometimes we want the shiny thing that we can hold on to, but many more times it's a peace that surpasses understanding that no drug can give you and no influx of money can give you. Only God can give you. But God will always bless. Hebrews 6, 10, it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Always do good to all, especially to the household of faith. Right? I sought your will 
Now respond according to your gracious nature. We're not testing God. We're calling God on what his word says. There's many places where it proves that you cannot outgive God. And he sets a good example. He's facing discord. He asks what is right. Handles his anger. How am I going to deal with this? How do we move forward? And then God en enables him to solve the problem. But many times it takes us saying, what about me? What is my part in the answer to this problem? It's very interesting working with people over the years. And, you know, some are kind of given to, to be good leaders because they're humble with that leadership. Others, mm, they seem good at the beginning and sometimes they misuse it. Sometimes they'll lead people well, but they'll never humble themselves to get dirty themselves either. And it happens sometimes. And you, oops, <laughs> don't have a perfect record with that one. But we need to pray, oh God, strengthen us. Help us to act like Nehemiah and stand against the pressures of our day. Help us to be men and women who visibly live according to what we profess, that this world may know. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of people like Nehemiah. Lord, the Bible's full of them, Lord, and thank you for these examples. Lord, history is full of men like this, people like this. Lord, may we be a people like this, especially in this day of compromise. May we be unbending, at the same time a gentle place to land. May we be full of principles, but so good at sharing those principles that people are able to receive from us, Lord. May we not only lead, but may we serve in our leadership examples, Lord. May we be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. That would be our heart, Lord. May we be found faithful, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's